ISIS has taken responsibility for that terror attack in London, the death toll rising again today. Crowds gathered for vigils take a look this evening to remember the lives lost. One of those, an American from Utah, celebrating a milestone anniversary there with his wife. Tonight we're learning more about the man who attacked the heart of London. Khalid Massoud, 52 years old, British born, believed to have acted alone, though he was long known to authorities here as an Islamist radical. Police now executing raids across the country, arresting eight and seizing evidence. The investigation centering on the city of Birmingham in the north of England, where Massoud was living, and ABC's Alex Markhart is there. This house is Massoud's last known address. It was raided overnight by police. One of his neighbors identified Massoud from a photo from the attack, saying that he was just a normal family man who liked to take care of his garden, but who left abruptly just after Christmas. Outside Parliament today, where the rampage happened, forensic technicians on their hands and knees, painstakingly searching for evidence. London was a city defiant. Parliament was in session. The Westminster Bridge reopened this afternoon. Hundreds of people gathered in London's Trafalgar Square on Thursday evening for a vigil to remember those killed or injured in Wednesday's attack in Westminster. The word solidarity was heard throughout the memorial service in which politicians and police chiefs vowed the terrorists would not win. This attack on our way of life, this attack on our shared values, shows the world what it means to be a Londoner. Londoners will never be cowed by terrorism. This is an Islamic Jihad attack. We've had 450 ISIS fighters been allowed to return to our country. stand together in the face of those who seek to harm us and destroy our way of life. According to Breitbart, Prime Minister Theresa May has said the Islamist attack on Parliament was not Islamic and Islam is a great faith. Taking on the role of a theologian, May insisted, it is wrong to describe this as Islamic terrorism. It is Islamist terrorism. It is a perversion of great faith. Islamism is generally defined as a political interpretation of Islam. Members of Parliament almost unanimously agreed with the Prime Minister lining up to warn against demonizing and stigmatizing Muslims and to condemn Islamophobia and racial and religious discrimination. As British authorities face the possibility of having been just attacked by terrorists, a new message on Wednesday from Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan with a warning that soon Europeans will no longer be able to walk safely on their streets. Tensions have been increasing between Turkey and the EU for months, starting with a ban the EU launched against Turkey when Germany and the Netherlands banned several Turkish ministers from holding campaign rallies for the upcoming Turkish referendum. It's not the first time Erdogan has threatened Europe. However, it is the first time the Turkish leader has verbally threatened the safety of European citizens directly. Ankara is in talks with Washington and Westminster to have Turkish Airlines in Istanbul's Ataturk Airport excluded from a ban which prevents passengers from carrying electronics larger than cell phones into the cabin of an aircraft. The foreign ministry spokesperson Hussein Mutogulu made the announcement at a press conference in Ankara. Our efforts continue to exclude Istanbul's Ataturk Airport, which we are very proud of from the ban. We continue to hold talks not only with the United States, but also with the United Kingdom, which might introduce a similar practice. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security said on Tuesday that passengers traveling from specified airports, including Istanbul, could not bring devices such as tablets, laptops and cameras into the main cabin of an aircraft. 
man has reportedly tried to drive his car into a crowded shopping street in Antwerp, Belgium. Local media report that military police stopped his vehicle, which was moving at high speed and ignoring traffic lights. The driver has now been arrested. Police say no one was injured in the incident. They also say the suspect was in a car with French number plates. Media report that police found weapons and military equipment inside of his vehicle. Now, a local news agency citing the city's mayor says it's possible that a terror act was averted today. A bomb squad has now been deployed to the scene. The incident comes a day after the one-year anniversary of the Brussels terror attacks. Belgian authorities say they have stepped up security in Antwerp. We are hearing that he was, to quote, of North African descent. And the local media is reporting that he is a radicalized Muslim. But at this stage, we have no name, we have no indication as to who exactly he is. Extra military staff and police are on high alert. They have been brought in across the whole city. And we certainly are hearing that was that what was a potential terror attack has been averted. Costa Rican authorities arrested the Somali citizen on Wednesday after U.S. officials confirmed his alleged links to, quote, international terrorist organizations. The man, identified with only the last names Ibrahim Cordine, entered the country from Panama on Monday. He was taken to a migrant shelter where he was eventually picked up by authorities. De accesar a base de datos. Security Minister Gustavo Mata credits improved controls at the border and databases shared with the U.S. In this case, we are able to pick this person out of 20,000 people due to the alerts linked to him. The suspect is currently in police custody awaiting interrogation by U.S. immigration officials. Meanwhile, during more than a year of vetting, Australia denied 500 Syrian refugees entry into the country for security reasons. Australians Immigration and Border Protection Minister says Wednesday's deadly attack near Britain's parliament is evidence that his country made the right decision to use caution when admitting refugees from Syria. Australia says that during that period of vetting, the country did allow 12,000 refugees from the Middle East. In Israel today, a Jewish teenager who holds both U.S. and Israeli citizenship was arrested in connection with a wave of bomb threats phoned in to Jewish community centers around the world. The FBI worked with Israeli authorities to arrest this 18-year-old man who covered his face as he appeared briefly in court. A U.S. law enforcement official tells CBS News he's believed to be responsible for most of the 160-plus bomb threats phoned into Jewish centers in the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. Israeli police spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld. We're looking to see the identification of the suspect himself, his profile, what were the motives behind him carrying out those threats. The source says agents now believe the suspect used an anonymizer to mask his phone number and IP addresses and may have programmed calls in rapid succession. Meanwhile, his public defender said the man suffers from a brain tumor that may have had an effect on his cognitive functions. The lawyer, Galit Bosch. This is a young person that, because of his uh, very, very serious medical condition, uh, didn't serve in the army, didn't go to high school, didn't go to elementary school. Evan Bernstein is with the Anti-Defamation League. Even though now there may be some relief, it's not a time for institutions to ratchet back on their security protocols. It's a time to maintain that diligence and, and to not get complacent in any way. The suspect's lawyer says he will now be sent for a medical evaluation. It's not yet clear whether U.S. authorities may seek extradition or file charges of their own against him. A former Russian member of parliament who defected to Ukraine has been shot and killed in Kiev. A murder in broad daylight in the center of Kiev. Denis Voronenkov had only just left his hotel with his bodyguard when a man opened fire. As a result of the shootout, one man was killed. His bodyguard was wounded and the killer was also wounded. Both are in hospitals and being given medical assistance. But the attacker died shortly after. Voronenkov was a former Russian MP and a key witness in a treason case against Ukraine's ousted leader, Viktor Yanukovych. He was also an outspoken critic of the Kremlin and its annexation of Crimea in 2014. Last year, Russia declared he was a suspect in a $5 million property fraud. And not long after, Voronenko defected to Ukraine, 
where he was given citizenship. Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko has called the killing an act of Russian state terrorism. In a statement he said, Voronenko was one of the main witnesses of the Russian aggression against Ukraine, and in particular the role of Yanukovych regarding the deployment of Russian troops to Ukraine. But Kremlin denies any involvement, and has said that claims of a Russian hand in the murder are absurd. Apocalyptic scenes in eastern Ukraine as a massive arms depot explodes. This, say the country's military, was an act of sabotage, possibly triggered by a drone. Some 20,000 people for kilometers around the town of Balaklia were being evacuated from their homes. There are no reports of injuries. The huge base is just 100 kilometers from the front line of Ukraine's conflict, and ammunition stored there is reportedly used to supply Ukrainian troops fighting pro Russia rebels. An investigation for sabotage is underway amid suspicions an explosive device could have been dropped by a drone after reports of a previous attempt two years ago. Moscow may be helping supply Taliban militants. According to Reuters, the top U.S. general in Europe said on Thursday that he had seen Russian influence on Afghan Taliban insurgents growing. He did not elaborate on what kinds of supplies might be headed to the Taliban, or how direct Russia's role might be. Russian officials have denied they provide aid to the insurgents. They say their limited contacts are aimed at bringing the Taliban to the negotiating table. According to U.S. estimates, government forces control less than 60% of Afghanistan. Almost half the country is either contested territory or under control of the insurgents. A sign of growing strength by the Afghan Taliban. Officials saying fighters have taken the key district of Sangin after security forces pulled out of the area in the notorious southern province of Helmand. The capture highlights the scale of the challenge facing the government and its international allies. Many British and American soldiers died in the fight to keep Sangin, which is a key strategic location giving access to the north of the province. Since NATO pulled out troops in 2014, Afghan forces have struggled to contain the spreading insurgency on their own. Helmand is vital in Afghanistan's billion-dollar opium trade and is largely already in the hands of the Taliban. The group has made major gains in the Sangin area in the past two years and say they captured a police headquarters and a military base overnight on Thursday, taking equipment abandoned by government forces. It all comes as Donald Trump weighs up America's commitment to a conflict now in its 16th year with no end in sight. More fighting is expected across Afghanistan as the warmer weather sets in. Officials warning 2017 may be even tougher than last year. The Egyptian military says 10 of its soldiers have been killed during clashes with the Daesh terrorist group. The army said in a statement that their soldiers lost their lives in two roadside bombings in the Sinai Peninsula. The statement added that 15 terrorists were also killed in the fighting. In recent years, the volatile region has been the scene of deadly attacks on security forces by terrorists linked to Daesh and Al-Qaeda groups. They have taken advantage of the turmoil created after the country's democratically elected president, Mohamed Morsi, was ousted by the military in 2013. Clashes have intensified on the outskirts of Damascus. This marks the fiercest fighting Damascus has witnessed in over a year. Today is the fifth straight day of heavy fighting in the industrial zone of Al Qaboon where terrorists based in neighboring Jobar district are trying to take control of. Just behind me is Al Qaboon industrial area where the Syrian army is confronting terrorists of the Al Nusra front who are trying who are trying to advance. The Syrian air force has just launched an airstrike against terrorist positions just behind me here in the industrial area and Jobar. Aerial and artillery strikes targeted the vicinity of the textile factory north of Jobar. The Syrian army says its attacks on terrorist positions in Jobar have killed hundreds of them. Thank God we are repelling the terrorists. The artillery and air force are assisting us well. Our morale is very high. On the ground, clashes were also intensifying. Street-to-street -street fighting shows how close the warring sides are. 
Terrorists are aiming to link eastern Ghouta to militant-held Qaboon. We don't let the terrorists connect Qaboon with Jobar. God willing, we will achieve victory. On Sunday, a large number of terrorists led by Al-Nusra Front, currently known as Fath al-Sham, launched a major offensive against Syrian army positions between Jobar and Qaboon. The aim is to lift a Syrian army siege on terrorists in Qaboon and establish a lifeline for them. So far, they have failed. Elsewhere, the Syrian government has accused Turkish, Saudi and Qatari spy agencies of being responsible for the recent escalation of terrorist attacks near the capital Damascus. In two letters to the UN, the Syrian foreign ministry called on the Security Council to take necessary measures against what it calls acts of terror by al-Nusra Front and other terrorist groups. The foreign ministry said such attacks are aimed at disrupting the upcoming peace talks in Geneva. Damascus has previously expressed regret over what it described as the UN's failure to condemn terrorist attacks across the war-torn country. As he confronts a volatile and changing world, President Trump has sought quietly, sometimes directly, other times through aides, to shore up relations with key allies. One of them is Saudi Arabia. And today, in a rare and exclusive interview with our chief Washington correspondent, James Rosen, the Saudi foreign minister takes stock of the new president and his predecessor. Closing out his second year as Saudi Arabia's top diplomat, His Excellency Adil al-Jubair, formerly the ambassador to the United States from 2007 to 2015, told Fox News in an exclusive interview at the Saudi embassy that the U.S.-Saudi relationship has reached one of its historic high points just since January 20. What do you make of Donald Trump? I believe that he's an exceptional human being. I believe that he has vision. I believe that he uh, understands the importance of having America play a big role in the world. We support that. We have communicated in no uncertain terms with every player in the region that that's a red line for us. When President Obama declined to enforce the red line he had drawn against Syria's use of chemical weapons, America's Arab allies responded with disbelief and anger. While the foreign minister avoided direct criticism of Mr. Obama, Al Jubair left no doubt that Riyadh saw the Obama presidency bringing U.S. Saudi relations to a new low and damaging American credibility and standing across and beyond the Middle East. When there is a vacuum in the international system, evil forces flow into that vacuum and that emboldens them to take more aggressive actions and we saw um, the uh, uh, Iranians doubling down in Syria, we saw North Korea uh, opening up a second nuclear reactor. Um, we believe those may not have happened uh, had the red line been respected. The foreign minister said the nuclear deal the Obama administration and five other world powers negotiated with Tehran had had, quote, a very negative effect in the region. Then we've seen after the agreement was signed more intensive nefarious activities by Iran. Um, the Iranians have to understand that the nuclear agreement does not shield them from uh, 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 retaliation by the world for violating the ballistic missile accords or for violating human rights or for supporting terrorism. The Saudis see President Trump and his aides taking a harder line than Mr. Obama and his aides did on Iran. I believe they will be less forgiving of Iran's violations of the missile accords, its threats to maritime security in the Bab al Mandab area and in the Straits of Hormuz. I believe they will um, be very strict in enforcing the nuclear agreement to the letter. Next week, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres will travel to Jordan to attend an Arab summit following a row over the release of a UN report accusing Israel of being an apartheid state. Ahead of the Arab League summit, Guterres will arrive in Amman on Monday for talks with King Abdullah II and to visit a refugee camp. An Arab delegation had met with Guterres earlier to protest the removal of the report by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia and the removal of the agency's head, Rima Khalaf. The report's authors concluded that Israel has established an apartheid regime that systematically institutionalizes racial oppression and domination of the Palestinian people as a whole. The report had been promptly condemned by the United States, Israel, and Guterres, and an aide from Guterres' office said that the report had been published without prior consultations and that did not reflect his views. Palestinian Authority UN Ambassador Riyad Mansour has said that bullying tactics and intimidation led to the dismissal of both the report and Rima Khalaf. Sources close to the matter say that federal investigators are looking into North Korea's possible role in a multi-million dollar cyber heist. Thieves stole $81 million from accounts for Bangladesh's central bank at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York last year. 
Reported by CBS News, investigators began their probe into North Korea after they discovered similarities in the code used in the theft and the code and the code used in the hacking attack on Sony Pictures in December 2014. The theft is considered to be one of the biggest bank robberies in modern times. I've seen them hauling in all the boulders and the gravel and stuff to repair it with. Will state workers be able to fix this hole in the Oroville Dam spillway in time? That's the question the entire town is asking itself. Who knows? Hopefully they do. I hope so. That way we don't have a catastrophe again. Team of experts says the clock is ticking. According to the Associated Press, a federally created investigating team released a report stating the main spillway must be repaired by November. The state faces a, quote, very significant risk. Do you think they'll get it done by November 1st? No. The way that the uh, thing was, you know, just tore up so damn bad it take a long time to fix that. Right. Fox 40 asked the California Department of Water Resources for that report. It claimed it didn't know which report the AP was referring to. In a statement, the DWR says, in part, DWR's objective is to have a fully functional spillway before the start of the next storm season. It continues, we'll be working round the clock through spring, summer, and fall to make that happen. The way government does things, well, maybe they'll make, well, there ought to be enough money around, though. Brown ought to get enough and maybe get some from Washington. What that significant risk the report warns about is, is also unclear. Fox 40 reached out to several of the experts who worked on the project, all of whom referred us to the DWR. Most in town we spoke with hope, if they have to evacuate again, that it runs smoother. Last time they gave us about 25 minutes evacuation. The town's confidence in the state's ability to fix the problem are mixed. You confident the state's going to get it all fixed and ready by November 1st? I think so. They've been working on it diligently. I hope they don't rush it and mess it up, but as long as they get the job done. The World Meteorological Organization has decided to add 11 new cloud classifications. That's to their international cloud atlas, and this is a big deal because it is the first time they've added anything in 30 years. Now, the incredible ones, I love these, these are my favorites, the hole punch clouds, they're now going to actually be called CAVM. And yes, these are real clouds, they are real formations. This is not a trick, that is real life, people. My other favorite here, Kelvin Helmholtz, and they are actually going to take on the official classification of fluctus. That is not a disease. That is now a cloud type. Asperatus, which is incredible, it's Latin for wave-like in roughness. You get why these clouds were named this. Basically perfectly suited for the clouds that were first documented by the Cloud Appreciation Society. So it goes to show observation leads the way in science. Who knows? You might be the one to spot the next cloud type, so keep your eyes skyward. NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory has recorded a stretch of spotless Sundays, suggesting that our parent star is experiencing a period of relative calm. Spots tend to appear in times of turbulence and disappear when activity is occurring at a decreased intensity and frequency. Extreme periods of such state are called solar maximum and solar minimum, respectively, and occur in 11-year cycles. While the current spotless appearance of the sun does not represent a full-on minimum period, it does suggest one is coming. Astronomers anticipate such an event will occur in 2019 or 2020. The recent picture shared by NASA was taken on March 20th, and in the midst of a 15-day run of spotlessness, the longest period recorded since the last solar minimum, which occurred in 2010.